Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Yahushua the Messiah. I'm going to be sharing finally a message study that I had put together by the leading of the Holy Spirit titled Something to Look Forward to. I still need to finish up Thy Hidden Ones by Jesse Penn Lewis, but I'm going to postpone that and get going on. I believe it's part five I will be doing next Wednesday, but this is a message study I've been wanting to put out for some time now. Before I get started, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Open us up in prayer. Father, Abba, Yahweh Most High. I come to you now this, this evening with this opportunity, opportunity that you have opened up for me to share this message that's been on my heart for some months now. And I ask you, Father, that everything that needs to be put together with the reading and everything else, because I haven't gone back and, and really looked over it for some time because I've had it ready for a while. So whatever it is that you want said, anything that has been, hasn't been a part of this study that you want me to share, that it would be spoken by your leading, that you would take over my tongue, over my lips, take over this recording, that you prepare every heart of those who will listen, that it will go down deep, that the word of your truth that brings life, that brings encouragement, admonishment, instruction, reproof, will reach down into every heart, into every mind and every soul, that you will lead to hear this message. Your will, Abba, Father, not my will be done because it is my desire to do your will and to accomplish that which you have created me to do for such a time as this. Let this word bring the encouragement and the hope that we, your people, need to hear with these times that we are presently in. We know more judgments are about to come down. But when it comes to those who are truly yours, those who keep their purpose and their eyes and their hearts and minds fixed upon you, the author and the finisher and perfecter of our faith, we don't have to be afraid because you have not given us a spirit of fear, but you fill us with the power of your holy set-apart Ruach with your love and a sound and disciplined mind. Help us to look to you, to keep our eyes and our focus upon you and to hunger and thirst for more of you and all that you reveal through your word that we would embrace and receive them by your spirit to accomplish all that you set out to accomplish, let none of your word return to you void. But let it do what you will, and not my will be done. Hallelujah. I'm going to get started in Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Yahushua from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Messiah from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The word raised means lifted, exalted, elevated, restored to life eternal. We too who have the Holy Spirit living and dwelling in us will also 
be raised from the dead by the spirit of our Yahuwah Elohim, who raised Messiah, Yahushua, from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 45 says, Okay. These numbers, these numbers are so tiny. <laughs> 42. Let's see what we got here. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a living life giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. I know I said to 45, but I just want to read a little bit. just want to finish this out. Okay, let's see where I'm at. And afterwards, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is Yahuwah from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who were made of dust. And as the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly. And as we have been born and as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. That is something to look forward to. And I, I really do want to read further because we know what what's going to happen for those of us who continue to endure with him to the end. Now this I say, and this is verse 50 now, Brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put, put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O oh, hates, where is your victory? For the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to Yahuwah Elohim, who has given us the victory through our Messiah, Yahushua. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of our Master, Yahushua, knowing that your labor is not in vain in Yahuwah. That's a very encouraging word. This is what we are looking forward to. Everything, beloved brothers and sisters, that we are going through, no matter what that test is, no matter what you are called to endure, no matter how much stress or difficulty or that squeeze or that pressure that is being applied to each and every one of us who belong to our Yahuwah, our Elohim, our Abba Father, we have a hope. We have a hope and we know that the time is going to come and it's going to come very soon that corruption will take on incorruption and our mortal bodies will take on immortality and we will have those heavenly bodies. They will be changed. They will be glorified. They will never perish.
they will be eternal. That's something to look forward to. That is where we need to be keeping our sights and our focus on what is going to take place to those of us who will endure, to those who will allow whatever needs to be done in each and every one of us so he can accomplish his work in our lives so that he can remove those things in us that are unholy, that are not pleasing to the Father. Those sins that we need to repent of, those areas that we need to be cleansed and purged so that we can be a bride that is ready without spot or wrinkle. Let's look at what resurrection means. Being revived and made alive from death, a rising again, being restored to life again, which is eternal. Corruption, sown in impurity through the fall of Adam and Eve. We were called sons of Adam after the fall, born with a depraved, fallen, and sinful nature. Separation, separation from he who created us. Sin separates us from Yahuwah Elohim. Even though the blood of Yeshua Messiah gives us the power to be free from the dead and from our corrupt fallen nature, which is nailed to the cross, our, our physical bodies will still need to die. Our physical bodies will not regenerate outwardly due to the judgment pronounced on Yah's creation from the fall of man and this fallen world that we live on. No flesh can see Yahuwah and live. Let me read 1 Corinthians 15, 50. I think I already, I already read it, but I want to read it again. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. All that is physical, where we live in the physical matrix of time and space, will all pass away. We will go back to this further reading in 1 Corinthians 15, but let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing. Yet, the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the, at the things which are not seen, but the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So our bodies which are sown in corruption will be raised and elevated to life in incorruption, that which is incapable of decaying and wasting away. And I think I go into what dishonor means, but I do want to stay here a little bit in 1 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. We need to understand, beloved, that it is so important to be looking on those things that we cannot see in the natural. We cannot put our stock in anything of this world, no matter what it is. The things that you have, the things that you own, any jobs you may have, any wealth or anything that you may have incurred in your savings account, no matter what it is. I mean, some of these things we know are helpful and they're beneficial. For those of us who need to go here or there, we need our vehicles. We, we, we know this. But we have to understand that all of these things 
all of these physical things. It doesn't matter what it is or who it is. It's going to pass away. It says it right here in verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. They're temporary. And I love this part too in verse 16 where it says, Oh, verse 17, for our light affliction, light affliction. I want to look that up, beloved. What does light mean? Let's look into this a little more. I'll get rid of this here because I can't see. I'm going to read this here. This is good. Coming from uh, the Forerunner commentary in Matthew 10, 21 through 22. It says, the question always is, how do we endure to the end, no matter what we face now or in the future. Like Messiah and Paul, how can we set our minds so that we see our burdens and afflictions as light? Let's see what it says in Matthew 11.30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is, a critical, this is critical because if we consider our trials as too much to bear, will we endure? But if we see our trials as light, whatever they may be, enduring to the end almost becomes assured. So how do we make this mindset a part of our lives? As I already read to you that for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's beautiful. Paul gives us something to consider, which is but for a moment. The simple fact is that when compared to eternity, our existence in this life, no matter how long, is but for a moment. Several scriptures emphasize this reality, for he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passeth away and does not come again. That's in Psalms 78, uh, 39, for he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh again. That's what it says in there. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. That's in James 4.14. Man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. That's in Job 14.1-2. through 2. Our lives are only a moment in time when compared to eternity. After a thousand years under Messiah's rule, will today's pain or pains even be a memory? Many readers have had a taste of how this works. Ladies with children have experienced how a short period of intense pain in the now can be overwhelmed by the joy that comes afterward. And uh, let's see what it says in John 16:21. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born and to the world. And that is so true, being a mother myself. It must be a light burden in comparison because many, knowing the pain, will repeat the experience. And for some, often in subsequent years, how often does the memory come back? Probably not off often, if at all. A helpful practice then is to embed in our thinking this foundational concept of just how short our, our lives are compared to eternity. This takes prayer and meditation to make this a living reality for each of us, helping to guard against being overwhelmed by the now. That's 
from Pat Higgins. Uh, and again, this is taken from, this was not in my notes, but I felt led to really look into this and about a light affliction. I will read a little further here in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. To help us endure hardship, Paul gives us a valuable mindset when he says our suffering is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. To see our afflictions as light, like we read about in Matthew 11, 30, that says, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. We must recognize the value of our calling. We would do well to consider its benefits often. As Paul indicates, the understanding that there is a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory is a necessary component to seeing our trials in this life in comparison as a light affliction. Let's see what this they say affliction. So affliction by Martin G. Collins is affliction is a necessary aspect of life yielding positive results in terms of character strengthening. Suffering and affliction paradoxically strengthen character while ease and comfort weaken human personality and character. The Apostle Paul's abundant afflictions and infirmities, including his troublesome thorn in the flesh, actually strengthen him spiritually. Purposes for infliction include corrective discipline and spiritual maturity, sanctification and purification, and Elohim's glory. Yahuwah, our Father, also suffered anguish and affliction when we sin and bring misery upon ourselves by yielding to, to temptation. Messiah was made perfect in his role of high priest by suffering. Compared to the ultimate joy we will experience, trials are exceedingly brief. So we have to understand that the Father also suffers too when we are in anguish and affliction, when we sin and bring misery to ourselves. We cause him suffering too. We don't consider that. Many times we do not consider what we do and what it the pain it causes our father when we understand that we will understand oh i don't know i must have accidentally gotten x out of that one hold on just a minute so we looked at what affliction is a recognition that enables one to endure to the end therefore it is vital to know that the price we pay now is minuscule compared to the reward that awaits us. Note the power of that vision. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, Elohim is not ashamed to be called their Elohim, for he has prepared a city for them, as it says in Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Okay, just brought that up. And I'll look at verse 15, it says, And truly they, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. And they desire a better country. So this is what he pretty much said. Having this vision in their lives as a daily reality enabled the heroes of faith to endure to the end. In modern jargon, they did a cost-benefit analysis and concluded that the benefits made the costs insignificant. Messiah and Paul made the same analysis, concluding that their burdens and afflictions were light costs compared to what the benefits of eternity held for them. That is so important that you understand that, beloved. That whatever it is that we're called to endure, whatever the burdens, whatever the afflictions, whatever the trials, whatever the persecutions that any of us are going through or any who have preceded us, their light compared to what the benefits of eternity hold for each and every one of us who will endure with him till the end. In Romans 8, 18, even with the weight of his trials, Paul again emphasizes that they are 
inf infinitesimal costs, so trivial that they are insignificant compared to the mind-boggling benefits that await us. For I consider that the sufferings of this pres present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In the King James Version, the first part of Proverbs 29:18 reads, Where there is no vision, the people perish. For perish, a better translation is that they cast off restraint. Without a vision, they lack restraint, leading to disobedience. This result in a people who will not endure to the end, whose fate then is to perish. Without a vision of the future that is as tangible to us as the present, we will walk by sight, only seeing the now, rather than by faith seeing as real a true vision of the future. Without that vision, we risk trading the future for the now. A poor bargain, indeed. This is why, beloved, this is titled something to look forward to. That is what we need to keep our, our purpose and our vision looking towards rather than what we're seeing in the present, in the natural. Galatians 6, 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. Revelation 2, 26, Consider how much the lust for power is a major motivating force in this world. It can be seen operating in families and workplaces, in assemblies and in commerce, and possibly it is most visible in politics. We can see in all of these instances that people are doing what they can to obtain power, often by any means available, fail, fair or foul. They are just following the influence. First John 519. And we know that we are Elohims and the whole world lies in wickedness. Of the one of the first uh, uh, lust and of, of the one who first lusted for power, I will exalt my throne above the stars of Elohim. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation or the, on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud and I will be like the most high. That's in Isaiah 14, 13 through 14. And this, I, I feel led to really read this because this is where, where we get in trouble. We're looking for whatever it is that we can gain in this life. Whether it's material things or whether it's power that we can have to usurp over other people. And this is what the enemy has done. This too, beloved, is going to perish. This too is going to come to an end. So while the world is struggling to get power, Elohim promises to give it to us as a byproduct of enduring to the end. In this life, the only power we have to strive for is the power over ourselves. That's to deny ourselves, beloved. That's consider considering that we are crucified. Our old, simple, fallen nature is nailed to the cross. That's what we keep putting off every day. And we put on that which is he, he has given us, that new creation, that new nature. That is the power that we need to walk in. In the next, Elohim will provide the rest. Those who seek power in this world miss the fact that our life is but for a moment. Even if they do deserve the power they seek, it lasts only for an instant in comparison. Consider how long our, our power will last if we endure to the end. For you who knows, the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. Let's see what it says. In, for you, okay, that's in Psalm 37, verse 18. Get that back here. The vision scripture provides is so all encompassing that not one of us can truly comprehend its breadth. After all, this vision is actually Elohim's own vision. Our minds are limited in what we can see, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 2.9. But as it is written, eye has not seen, I love this scripture, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which Elohim 
has prepared for those who love him. But with that said, Elohim gives us the means, his spirit, his Ruach, in 1 Corinthians 2.10, to follow the example of our predecessors so that we, like them, will see a vision that ensures our enduring to the end. Part of that vision involves identifying the things we hate about this evil world around us and then finding the scriptures that illumine the vision of how Yahuwah's will, together with us, using the power he will give us, create a new world devoid of these evils. Each of us is unique, and what part of that vision will motivate us will likewise be unique. So before our burdens and afflictions begin to weigh us down, we can choose to prepare now. So I would encourage you all to read Matthew 25, 1-13. through and take the time to identify the evils we hate. With that, we can bin, begin building a vision from Scripture that through meditation and prayer, which will allow Elohim to use His Spirit to make that vision as real as the present, to the effect that in comparison, we will be able to say along with Messiah and Paul, My burden is light, and my light affliction is but for a moment. Thank you, Father, for leading me to that. That was an excellent resource, excellent commentary on what light affliction is. Okay, so as we had read in, I think it was in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 43, jumping back there, Here we go. It says, the numbers get so tiny when you're looking at it. Now, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Um, so what was I getting here? It says, so our bodies which are sown in corruption will be raised and elevated to life and in corruption, that which is capable of decaying and wasting away. Dishonor means disgrace shame, blemished, and impure reputation, reproach, destitute of spiritual, uh, just destitute, okay? So that's our bodies have been sown in dishonor in these, these bodies that are going to perish, these temporary dwellings. Glory is brightness, shining, to be enlarged, or spiritual enlargement, splendor, magnificence, and honor, dignity, exalted rank, noble, good reputation, reverence, high bodily estate. In other words, a glorified body. So you see we're going to go be raised from a disgrace and a blemished and an impure. Our bodies are impure. They are destitute. And they're going to be in exchange for a body that is bright, shining, magnificent, of an exalted rank. Nobility means of the highest ranking order. Reverence, bodily estate, which is a glorified body. So we have weakness. We know our body is sown in weakness, which is a lack of physical strength, lack of moral force or effect of the mind, feeble, failing, defective, infirm. Uh, susceptible to sickness and infirmities, diseases. Do we know this about our bodies? We know that we are we, our bodies are weak. They truly do. We they're even those who seem like they can they can really pump some iron. That's going to be good for a period of time. But when you get to a certain age, you're not going to be as strong. You just get and the older that we get, the weaker that we get. So we do lack. We lack that moral force the effect of the mind which is feeble and failing and defective. Now, of course, with Messiah, he's, he is able to give us what we would not have outside of knowing him, outside of Messiah, outside of the Holy Spirit. He gives us these strength. He, it says in his word, he is our strength and weakness. So we do experience a level of strength in him, even in these weak, feeble bodies even in these bodies that are defective and infirm, that were sown in weakness, 
and were susceptible to the sickness and infirmities. But what's going to happen? We'll be raised up in power. Ex exerted strength, force, moral, moral ability, divinity, command, authority. It makes perfect se spiritual sense that we would be raised up in, a, in, in divinity since we are the body of Messiah. So that makes sense, does it not? That is the purpose. That is where he's going to bring us. This is why it's important for us to understand these light and momentary afflictions and why we need to focus on the things that are not seen. We need to look at and know, beloved brothers and sisters, we do have much to look forward to. But if we're so busy looking at our afflictions and we're so busy looking at our our, our weaknesses and the dishonor and all these things that we are presently in, if we endure even with these, what we're carrying around in these bodies, even in these moments of this weakness and these trials and these troubles, we have the promise of his glory, of the glorified body. We have the promise of his power that exerts strength and force and moral ability, that perfect spiritual, uh, that divinity, that we are being promised for those of us who will endure with him till the end. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 3, 18. This is such a hopeful word. This is such an encouraging word. I've been waiting some time to share this. And I'm thankful that the Father has opened up this opportunity now because we really need to hear this. I know we've been hearing lots of words of judgment, and that's so. These things are going to happen. We know what's coming down. But this is why we need something to look forward to so that as we're going through these times of, of great refinement and sanctification, beloved, we need to look at what, what is ahead, what is beyond this life. We need to be keeping our sights and our focus on that, always. As it says in his word, Ye Yahushua said, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and is seated at the right hand of Abba Father. Scorning its shame. He was also, what, is he, what was he scorning? Because he was in a body. He stripped himself of all that was, that, all that glory. He did not take equality with Yehu Elohim, something that many of us cannot even begin to comprehend. And he came in likeness of a man in that body that we just talked about, that body of dishonor, of weakness. Who for the joy set before him, right? Enduring the cross, scorning its shame. That's the shame of this body that we live in. This is why Messiah had to die for us to give us something to look forward to so that we will not perish and these bodies and likewise perish for eternity. He's given us something to exchange. He's given us that exchange of glory for our dishonor, that exchange of our weakness for his power. And yes, we experience that glory and power just in part, but what we have to look forward to is going to be eternal. 2 Corinthians 3.18 Thank you, Father. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of Yahuwah, are being transformed in, into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of Yahuwah. So you see that. We're going to be transformed into the same image. But right now, our faces are veiled because of this dishonor and weakness that we carry around in these bodies. But we have a transformation that's going to be taking place. And that transformation has already begun in us through Messiah, through that new nature that he's given us that we yield to. He's bringing us from glory to glory by the Spirit of Yahuwah. 
I have a reference here in Psalm 102, 26. Let me read that. That's it now. Psalm 102, 26. Okay. Let's see where that's at. They will perish, but you will endure. <laughs> okay. I love that. They will perish, but you will endure. And I'll go a little further because it says, yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them and they will be changed. And I have a reference here about our glorified bodies for his righteous. That's what we have look forward to look forward to. And it says here in verse 27, but you are the same and your years will have no end. That's a beautiful promise, a precious promise for us, beloved. We do have something to look forward to. Thank you, Father. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Messiah, seek those things which are above. Right? It's the same thing as looking on those things that are not seen, rather than what is seen. For where Messiah is sitting at the right hand of Elohim, set your mind on things above. Set your mind there. What's above? What we're all looking forward to? Going from dishonor to glory, weakness to power. Corruptible taking on incorruptible. The mortality taking on immortality. That's what we need to set our minds on. Not on the things of the earth. Not on the things that are happening to us. Not focusing on woe is me and all these afflictions and troubles that we're going through. He told us where our mind needs to be. On what we all have to look forward to. For we have died and our life is hidden with Messiah in our Yahuwah Elohim. When Messiah who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's that splendor, that magnificence belonging to Yah, our most exalted, and, and for us to, and which we are going to be, that's his most exalted estate, and we're going to enter into that most exalted estate, because that's what glory means. We're waiting to appear with him in that most exalted estate. That's awesome. What hope we have. So keep your mind there. If you find your mind drifting off to these other things, keep it where it needs to be, on that which is above. Keep your mind on him, Messiah Yahushua. Keep your mind on his truth, on his word, those things that we need to keep building us up so that we will endure with him. And that whatever trials, whatever you're going through is there to sanctify you and help you to endure further and further until that time comes when we all will appear with him in glory, our most exalted estate. As I, I'm going to reiterate, so where are we to keep our focus and purpose and eyes on? Things above and not th the things on the earth. Why? Because where Messiah is seated above at the right hand of Yahuwah, that is where we will appear with him in glory. And everything on this earth in its fallen, corrupted state will be destroyed and purged by fire. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. Let's go there. Okay. Let's see if I can find where Second Thessalonians is. All right. Okay, seven through. Is that okay? Am I in Second Thessalonians? Okay. 
got to get the right one because sometimes I don't. <laughs> uh, let's see. So far, so so good, Father. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. Here, here we are. Boy, they're so tiny, these numbers. And to give you who are troubled rest. Let's go. That seems like we're getting in the middle of something here. So let's go a little bit further up. Okay, let's see where we can go. Let's start in verse 3. We are bound to thank Elohim always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith rose exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the other assemblies of Elohim, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of Elohim. Wow. Did you just hear that? Let me read that again. For your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of Elohim. So his righteous judgments for us come through our patience and faith in our persecutions and our tribulations that we're called to endure. That we will be counted worthy of the kingdom of Elohim for which you also, we also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with Elohim to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when Yahushua the Messiah is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know Elohim and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Messiah, Yeshua. Notice how it says those who do not know, but also those who do not obey. So those that don't know him, and these are not just talking about those in the world. It says in his world, he said, depart from me. I never knew you. He never knew them because they didn't know him. They might have done works in his name, but they did not know him. And not only did they not know him, but they did not obey the gospel of Yehusha HaMashiach. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of Yahuwah and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified. Wow, glorified. There's your word glory to be come before to us in his highest estate in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. That is very, very powerful. I would encourage you to go back and read that again. Really let the Holy Spirit speak to you with this. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. That's a lot of rich stuff in here. That can be another um, study message in and of itself. But for the sake of time and, and, and finishing out what the Holy Spirit has given me here, we're going to go to now 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7. For this they willing, willfully forget that by the word of Elohim the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that they existed perished being flooded with water but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Wow. So we see that. Are we seeing that that the earth also everything on the earth in its fallen corrupted state will be destroyed and purged by fire? We see that. But also those that judgment of fire are going to be coming upon the perdition of ungodly men. 
I want to look up the word here, perdition. That's damnation, eternal damnation. To be eternally damned, separated from the Father. That's what will come of those that are ungodly. Let's look up the word ungodly. I want to look it up in the Noah Webster, 1828. going as the spirit leads beloved okay let's see what we got all right let's look that up there we go ungodly means those who are wicked those who have lacked the fear and worship of our Elohim okay for those of you who think that he did away with the commandments, it also says, or violating his commands. Two, what ungodly means is sinful, contrary to the divine commands, as of ungodly deeds. So the reference that is given to violating of his commands is 1 Peter 1, 4 through 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And in Jude 1, 4, it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Elohim. Where do we hear the those who are taking the grace of our Elohim into lasciviousness and denying the only Yahuwah Elohim, our Messiah, Yahushua? They're denying him by doing that. Turning the grace of of Elohim into lasciviousness. Let's see what lasciviousness is. We want to take this as far as we can go, don't we? Lasciviousness. Okay. <laughs> if I do it here. Got to get the word right. Okay, that's it. Lasciviousness. Mm. Okay. That's wanton lust. That means whatever you're lusting and desiring in your, in your bodies. Whatever that could be. Let's see. We'll read more into what that means. Okay, Mark seven twenty one through 22. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, and lasciviousness. So we see that word in there. Um, there's lots of scripture that talk about lasciviousness. So based on the study, lasciviousness was a word used to translate to now actually known as debauchery, sensuality, and depravity. It's the, it, it clearly speaks against the, this behavior and focuses instead on calling believers to live holy and pure lives for Yahuwah. So it's the opposite of living a holy and pure life. It's living the life the way you want. It's Again, goes right back to that satan, what it says in the Satanic Bible, do what thou wilt. No, we don't want to do what we will. We don't want to use his grace to do whatever we will. Because his grace is to dare, there to give us favor that we don't deserve and the power that we need to not sin, but to overcome sin. Okay, let's go into um, 1 Corinthians. I might have already read this. Yes, we're going to do this because then we got more to read a breakdown of what some of these words are. So back to 1 Corinthians 15. I pray this is blessing you, beloved. It's blessing me. <laughs> it really is doing this. And then what he's been revealing that we're not in my notes. Thank you, Father, for that. 
So let's, I'm going to read 50 through 58 again, just so that it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Okay, we'll go there. Mystery is a profound secret, wholly unknown, cautiously concealed. Yahuwah's divine nature, providence, which is not revealed to man, that which is beyond human understanding and comprehension, an enigma, anything artfully made difficult, such as understanding scriptural contradictions that short circuits our human reasoning. Thus, these things don't contradict but are in harmony from where Yah sees it. These are mysteries not meant to be solved, but will be, but will be revealed. And we will know when we pass from physical death to our glorified eternal body. So some things that we think that we need, the, the, some things that he says are a mystery need to remain a mystery. We can't unpack and know everything. There's a lot he is revealing and giving to us, giving to us in these times that we need. But there's other things we need to leave alone and know what they are because that's what mysteries are. They're not meant to be solved. But will, be, but will be revealed, and we will know when we pass from physical death to our glorified spiritual eternal bodies. He says we will know when he appears. We will know as we are known. That's what it says in his word. So we, that's the mystery. So behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now he's actually telling us this mystery. He's revealing to us what... Many of them didn't even know even prior to this in full. So Paul is giving them and saying, now this mystery is being revealed to you about corruption, uh, inheriting that which is incorrupt, that we shall not all sleep, but will be changed. In that moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And that when that trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible may put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Let's look at the word changed. So that part I was saying to you, we only know in part, is in 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Changed means exchanged, renewed, replaced. To turn or pass from one state to another to alter. So we're going to be renewed. These bodies are going to be replaced with a glorified, uh, uh, an exalted state that has been created. He has, he said he went, he said he had to go so that he can create. What did he say he was going to go to uh, about the, um, many, about many rooms. I, I think this has a lot to do with it. I, I just me personally, I'm just, uh, he, he goes to prepare a place. Uh, I just don't think it's like we're all going to have our own little because uh, this is the mystery. Let me read this. It's just what I'm getting. I'm going to go with it, Father. John 14, 3. He says, Yeshua says, and I go and prepare a place for you. I'll come back and take you to be with me and you will also be where I am. So he's preparing us. And, well, it says here, my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. So he's preparing us for this mystery, I believe, to where we will all be changed. We are going to be those many rooms in the father's house. We're going to have, we're, he's going to make room for us because we cannot, nobody can see, no flesh can see you who and live. So we need to have those glorified bodies, those ones that are being prepared for us. That which is corruptible is going to take on incorruption so that we can be in the Father's house. You can, this is just what I'm getting. I'm not saying this is so, but to me it makes sense that we are those rooms. We are the ones that he's preparing it for us, for the bodies that he's going to give us in place of the ones that are corrupted. He has an uh, 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 incorruptible body for each and every one of us. 
getting ready when that last trump takes place and we're going to experience this transformation we're going to experience this mortal putting on immortality that's beautiful beloved this should excite you let's read first peter 1 3 through 9 i don't think i read that no i read second peter so first peter well i'm almost finished with this but going through this now it was so exciting thank you father so so exciting we have so much to look forward to beloved so much to look forward to hold on hang on don't lose hope do not be weary in well-doing know that when you are suffering and what you are you're going through no other brothers and sisters and Yahushua are also going through suffering throughout the earth you're not alone first Peter 1 3 through 8 blessed be the Elohim and Abba father of our Yahushua Messiah who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Yeshua Messiah from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of Elohim through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time in this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while it if need be you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being a much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation the revealing of Yeshua Messiah are we not in the revealing of Yeshua Messiah are we not in the book of Revelation right now beloved we are we're coming into this time of this revealing whom having not seen you love though now you do not see him yet believing you rejoice with joy uh, inexpressible and full of glory receiving the end of your faith the salvation of your souls that's the ultimate what does it say those who endure to the end will be saved those who endure to the end what is waiting for us is that that body okay that does not perish we're waiting for that that time when that mortal shall take on immortality but we must endure with him with him to the end doing the things working out our own salvation with fear and trembling allowing to do whatever he needs to do to remove the stain the sins those things that are not wholly pleasing and acceptable to him receiving the end of your faith so there's a beginning and there's an end we're getting very close so we need to receive and continue to go forth in the enduring and uh, or receiving the end of our faith which is going to be the salvation of our souls but in the process of all this to what I just read to you in first Peter 1 3 through 9 we're called to have to not only we we're not only called to rejoice but with joy inexpressible and full of glory in other words how th this joy and the level of joy we need to have nobody can convey how can we express this kind of joy that he wants us to have because he knows he's on the other side of that he's outside of time and space he knows what is waiting for us and he wants us to be joyful for what is what is going to be ours for the receiving the end of our faith the salvation of our souls 
this undefiled that it talks about here. Let me see. It mentions that here because I have undefiled in this first Peter three through nine. And I just read that. Let me go back here, keeping the power revealed last time. Praise and glory and honor. Jesus Christ, corruptible. There you go. It's in verse, um, let me read that here just so we can get this. Blessed be the Yehu Elohim and Abba Father of our Yehusha Messiah, who according to his abundant mercy, I love that his mercy, that which we do not deserve, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Messiah from the dead, to inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for us. This is waiting for us, a inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that will not fade away. This undefiled means no longer polluted, no longer stained by sin, pure, clean, holy, perfected, set apart from our corruptible bodies. Oh, hallelujah. And fade, fade away means you will no longer vanish, wither, decay. To, uh, it says you will, you will be strengthened. You will not decline. You will be filled, but rather filled with vigor, vitality, and good health eternally, of course. <laughs> Kept for a future use. Withheld from dis uh, disclosure, concealed revealed so we will be kept for a future years use and till that time when it will be revealed unveiled discovered to make known hallelujah well that pretty much concludes this message and study titled something to look forward to beloved i would encourage you i truly would after listening to this take some time bring this to the father in prayer and i would encourage you to go back and listen to it again so that you will grab hold and get and be excited about what we all need to be looking forward to. Looking on those things which are not seen. Setting our sights above, not on here below. And not getting so bogged down by whatever it is that we're going through. Whatever trials, it's there as part of his righteous judgments to refine us, to get us ready for those bodies that he has waiting for us. That's exciting. I love you, beloved. I didn't, wow, an hour? Serious? Thank you, Father. When I do this, it seems like it's only like 15, 20 minutes. He is just so amazing. I'm going to be sharing at the end of this, um, this video the song that the Holy Spirit gave me some years ago called Resurrection, Resurrection Dead. I hope it does bless you all. I want you to know that you are in my prayers. I pray for his body. I pray that you are all encouraged by this precious gift and word of what we all have to look forward to that is coming as soon, quickly approaching that time where he says, look up for your redemption, draweth near, draweth nigh. So don't be discouraged no matter what you're going through. He will help you. Even as you're going through it, he will help you. Remember, they are light and momentary afflictions. Compared to eternity, they are light. Keep your eyes on him, who's the author, the, the finisher, and the perfecter of our faith. And until we all 
come together again, beloved brothers and sisters in Yahusha, I bid you all shalom. Someone may ask how the dead are raised With what kind of body will they come? So foolish a thought is true, you must know The mysteries of life flow from the sun It cost him his blood, such a price to be the rain.